sticking around on a Monday night. Or wait, it's Tuesday, isn't it? This is also my story, the story of a kid who was part of the movement, one that impacted him for the rest of his life. I played drums in a band, I went to shows, I supported my friends in their bands and became part of a scene. To this day, no matter what I'm involved with or what I do, the ethic I gained from this moment in time impacts that work. That ethic is the DIY ethic, do it yourself, in a way that is an alternative to how larger organizations accomplish a similar task. For me, at that time, the thing was music. Anyone could make music. If you had a guitar, drums, and someone who could sing, you could put together a band. In the 1990s, there were dozens of bands in Chicago. Every suburb had at least three or four good bands, countless others trying to make their way. But it was the bands who caught on, the good ones, that could move around the area, playing shows with other bands, forming relationships with those people in those other bands, the kids in the scene, and with the people who put on the shows. I was lucky enough to be in one. We played countless shows throughout Chicago and the suburbs with lots of good bands. We recorded music, put out records, screened our own t-shirts to sell at our shows, and traveled around the U.S. all on our own as part of the DIY music scene. As the scene went, you could make music, you could play shows, and you could put out your own records. And most of us did it ourselves with little help from any outside label. I mean, you came here because it was like five bucks. They had shows almost seven nights a week, especially Indian punk rock. It was the 90s music scene in Chicago. There were a few venues that could be counted on as good places for bands to play, aside from doing shows in someone's basement. Early on, places like McGregor's in the suburbs put on great shows, then the Rigby side in Chicago, and eventually the third floor loft in Elgin became a steady venue for shows. But it was the Fireside Bowl that became a recognized locale for all touring bands to want to play but the fireside was ours. And local folks put shows on there, and for five bucks you could see three or four bands play about three nights a week. We didn't need established clubs like Metro or big talent bookers because shows were booked and organized by a few guys in the scene and the bands who wanted to play. It was usually as simple as a phone call or a quick conversation at a show. With a central location, the scene not only had a unified ethic, but also a venue as a centralized hub. the fireside because it was different. It was a bowling alley. It was like, what is this? Like if the Metro or somebody wanted us to play some show, we were like, no, we just wouldn't do it. We're like, it has to be completely independent and DIY.
all of these memories came flooding back to me when I read The Access Principle by John Walensky, ideas about people doing things for themselves, the DIY ethic. Throughout much of this text, I kept getting angry and then frustrated by the idea that more people weren't pushing for open access publishing and following through on options available for writers to allow for their own writings to be self-published to promote their scholarship to a broader audience. As I read on, I kept thinking of academics struggling to publish in top-notch, well-renowned and respected journals, striving for publications much in the same way that some musicians wanted to make it by getting a great record deal with a big label. But for those who were really dedicated to making music and being part of the scene, the big record labels had nothing to offer us. We couldn't be persuaded to join the ranks of countless other bands who were with those big labels. In my mind, this is the same thing that open access journals can accomplish for scholars. Open access journals, and there are thousands out there in nearly any discipline, do not make publishing any easier or the publications a lesser quality. For most journals, retain the same peer review practices of their closed access counterparts, just as those lesser known record labels didn't jump at the chance to sign just any band to the label. For a band to sign, that band had to be great and show promise of future greatness. Open access journals provide more outlets for the publication. But the same qualities of greatness from the research and the writing must be present. This is identical to other more well-known closed access journals. The best thing about open access journals is their view of the purpose of scholarship, which, as Wolinski explains it, is that scholarship and information should be viewed as a public good, something that is regarded as beneficial and can be provided to everyone who seeks it. In this sense, open access journals take DIY a step further. They don't make the process of publishing any easier but they do make the process of accessing the scholarship by other researchers simpler. Open access journals allow free distribution and use of articles. Nobody owns the information, creating a free exchange of ideas. The scholarship can be located by anyone, and anyone can find that same information immediately. There are no subscriptions to information. I keep coming back to the idea of what matters. For these journals, the scholarship is what matters. It is more important than a profit or fame, which sounds a lot to me like the bands I hung around with in the 1990s. The music was what mattered, and they wanted to share it with anyone who was interested, but they didn't want to do it in a way that conflicted with their DIY ethic. Shows were always five bucks, CDs were never more than eight, and t-shirts cost ten dollars, no more. Of course, they could have charged more, and kids would have paid it, but that wasn't the point. The point was to share, to grow the scene, to make something special, to impact lives. And so it goes with open access scholarship. <laughs>